Good morning. Good morning. Good to see everybody. It's uh, exciting to know that we stand on a firm foundation, that we are on the rock of Jesus Christ. It's not the shifting sands that the world clings to, that the world looks to, that moves all the time, that's always changing. It's obviously grievous to our souls that we hear about this shooting that took place in Buffalo most recently, and that was one that took place, uh, another one, just a few weeks ago, where uh, it startles us, it shakes us. Sometimes we think, what's going on in this world? And I'll tell you what's going on in this world. There's a God out there who seeks to devour and destroy God's children and God's people. That's what's going on. He's the author of confusion. He's a liar. And he speaks people lies. People consume with these lies. And what do they do? They take hold of them and believe on them. And then they obsess over them. And then they sin. And what does sin ultimately bring? Death. 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 Don't be shocked, Christians. We live in a world that's fallen. And yet we've been given the truth of God. We are the light bearers. We are the ones who stand on the firm foundation. Don't be moved. We're ambassadors of Jesus Christ. We're just passing through. Let's get busy about his business. Let's cling to the thing that matter, that's eternal, and not to the affairs of the world. Amen? These things are shifting sands. These things are things that move all the time. Don't be shaken in your faith and your foundation. It's of God Almighty. Amen? It's an exciting thing. As we get into the message, I can't think of a more fitting backdrop to get into. God loves a cheerful giver. Where is our heart? Where is our attitude? You know, the Lord talks about giving cheerfully. Hilariously is literally what it says in the Bible. It means without any kind of reprehension or reservation. I cannot contain the flow of God's mercies and graces and goodness, and I need to sing it. The Lord said he puts a good new song in our hearts to sing unto the world. He makes us light bearers to pour out what he's given to us. Because we're in a world that needs God's love and hope and mercies and graces. Amen? It needs to have their eyes open as they're darkened by the sin and the darkness of the world and the devil of this world, the God of this world. But how do we do this? How do we get there? Lord, you don't know what I'm going through. Isn't it? The, the fall to darkness is one step at a time. It's subtle and slow oftentimes. Isn't it? Or it could be a tragic thing that happens to us quickly and now all of a sudden, I don't I my faith is shaken. I'm startled. I can't, I, I can't but take joy and solace in the worship that we had right before this as we sang of the goodness of the Lord and how he's a firm foundation. He's an ever or always present help in time of need. He does not move. He's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Where? What, so what's happening? Why are we like this? Fickle. Moving left and right. How do we get there? What changes our binding thinking to be faith givers? Why does our mind shift and take us away from faith? We've been burned so much by false preachers, false teachers, false Christians, people I don't want to go to church. I've been to many churches, and they're all a bunch of heretics. They're all a bunch of hypocrites. They're all preaching one thing and living another thing. They're slicking their hair back on TV and they're saying, give me your money. Give me your money. <laughs> and they've been burned. A lot of people have been jaded. Even non-Christians, jaded. They wear fancy clothes and they say, bow down and kiss my ring. And they themselves aren't the servants God's called them to be. To serve one another. Instead, they want to be worshipped. Amen? Isn't that it? They're clinging for what? The God of this world. I will rise on high. I will be the most high. It's not about giving hilariously. It's about taking violently, if need be, through coercion, through snatching. Isn't that the difference between Jacob, the heel catcher, the conniver, the shaker, the baker, the salesman, versus Israel, 
governed by God, broken, wrestled with God, and now I can do nothing. Help, it's all from you, God. And angels come down from Jacob's ladder and minister. All right, now I can do my work in you. Now a lot of you will flow torrents of living water from the Spirit of God. Now it's me, I'll be glorified, not you. Paul, as we're, as we're continuing on here, and again, guys, I cannot tell you how lifted I am and encouraged I am, not by the circumstances around me, not with who's in church, who's not in church, who's doing this, who's doing that. I don't care. God remains the same. I'm here to glorify God with what he's given me. And as I sit, and Josiah teaching the Back to Basics course, we've had this message put on our lap of giving our tithes, of giving our gifts. And he is right there in the Back to Basics course again. And you'll see, I did not plan this out. This is the message God has given us for today. And by the end, you'll know why. And you'll know this wasn't carried. His mighty hand is upon this church. Stop looking with your eyes and start looking at God, what he has planned for you. Miracles, guys. Miracles. I know we walk through the valley of the shadow of death with people shooting people in a mall. I got it. This isn't our home. We're just passing through. What are you going to do with the passing through? What are you going to do? I think this is one of the scriptures people take out of today's message from 2 Corinthians chapter 9. If you could go ahead and open your Bibles there. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. This is the one that many use to sum up the chapter. Verse 7. Every man give, every man according to his purpose in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or out of necessity, for God loveth the cheerful giver. God loves a cheerful giver. What is he doing? He's the one equipping you to be that cheerful giver. He's the one who's giving to you so you have to give. He's the one who's making sure you have abundance so that you have overflowing to give. But then he's saying, what are you going to do? Just give out of the overflow? Or give it all? It's not until we're broken, it's not until we have faith in God Almighty that we finally release everything. Isn't that what God really requires? Isn't that what God really said? I've come not to purchase just the outskirts of you. Not just the outer part that you dress up nice and neat and put on and slip your hair or, or do everything for eye candy for people to look upon on you like a slick evangelist <laughs> that are well over age. And they're trying to still maintain with the comb over. And you're like, dude, dude, let it go. It's going to the grave anyways. <laughs> this is not my permanent tent. Amen? They're getting on their bikes. I must have passed 20 people exercising. Some big that needed to be. Some that clearly were in shape. All different gamuts. Put them in their time. Where are they here? Where are they working on the inner part that really matters? Where are they when they get below the skin? To the heart of the matter. We're three-part beings last I knew. Amen? Exercise does profit the body little. It's beneficial to exercise. Are you exercising your spirit? Do you have overflowing attitude? Good attitude? Good perspective? Good vision? Or are you just looking with these things that are getting older every day and need glasses and need other stuff? Verse 1 of 2 Corinthians chapter 9. For as touching the ministry of the saints, it's superfluous for me to write unto you. It's meaningless. I have no need to. I'm going above and beyond. I already know you are doing the right thing. And yet, I'm going to say this anyway. He says, I have no need to instruct you. You know, some people don't come to church because they feel, I have no need. I've already heard it. Been there, done that. Paul says, I understand you are doing what I'm about to preach about. You are walking rightly. I really have no need to teach you. You already know these things that I'm about to say. Isn't that a good thing? Isn't that a great thing to hear? I already am doing what's right. 
Don't we all need more encouragement, though? Because what happens? We grow discouraged when we get into mundane. And we say, does this matter? Is anyone even watching? Does anyone even care what I'm doing? I think this happens more with women than it does with guys. We're always making sure we toot our more on children. But, but women are doing those mundane things day in and day out, oftentimes, that nobody cares about. It keeps the ship going. It keeps everything going together. The beautiful flowers. The things that are dressing that make things beautiful. Right? But guys do it too. Guys are doing it too. They go to their job day in and day out. Sometimes mundane. But they do it because they know in the end their family is fed. They know in the end they can clothe their, their, their children. They know in the end they can build the house and keep their, keep their roof on their, on their family and protect. Amen? It's in that mundane that you may not need a frivolous or superfluous compliment. But I commend you. Keep going. Do not grow weary in well doing for a new season. If you faint not, you will reap. We don't live for now. We're putting an investment for future. We're living for eternity. Amen? An eternal kingdom. Keep going. And yes, even now, you will see fruit. You will see fruit. Keep going. You're doing the right thing. Whether you see it or don't, keep going. He says, I have no need to tell you these things. The previous verses in chapter 8, he's talking to Jerusalem, the saints, basically. He's saying, I've come to collect money. I've come to get, to get tithes from the different churches that I can go back to my previous family where I was a Pharisee at once and now they know me as a Christian who's turned from my, my former ways of living for external glory to now I've given it all up to live for the glory of God. And I want to show them the fruits of my labor. I want to boast on you. I want to come to them and give of their needs because they're the ones that are the center and yet I want to give back to them. I want to get back to them from the fruits of me establishing churches all around. Take money from that and take and establish those people that are poor and the ministry that's taking place in Jerusalem. He wants to boast on the beauty of what God's done through the ministry that he's done through his missionary journeys. That's what he's talking about here. He says, I have no need. I'm excited about how the Lord is working in you, Church of Corinth. says in Acts chapter 11, verse 29, and Paul speaking of this, a previous collection of Jerusalem, the saints has described, then the disciples, each accord, uh, giving each according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren that dwell in Judea. The translation there of ministry is diakonai, which is basically give relief. Isn't that why we're here, to give relief? Isn't that what the church is about? The Lord says, come to me all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Isn't that what happens when we're overwhelmed with all the things going on in the world? And we're looking at all these trials and tribulations and struggles and how am I going to pay my bills as gas is going up and up and up and up and up. It was almost $5 yesterday when I looked at one of the gas stations. And we're thinking, how am I going to do it? The car starts leaking oil and I'm going, oh, how am I going to drive? How am I going to pay for my car? How am I going to handle this? It's too much. Come. All you who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. I will provide for your needs via Konai. I will give you relief. I will take despair and trade it for hope, assurance of a future. Come on, guys. We're passing through. What are you clinging to? What are you clinging to? What's ripping off your joy? What's shaking your foundation? Superfluous is above necessity. Very said that. The first church sold all they had and provided for the needs of the body. They were so on fire as the Holy Spirit kindled their hearts and they were seeing the miracles of God that they let go. They let go of everything that was stopping them from seeing God. They realized, I have no, no treasure in this world that's worth more than the gold I receive from heaven. I want to buy gold from heaven. I want to let go and sell all I have and take what you have, God. I've tasted this world and I've seen the destruction it causes. I've seen that I can ride the corporate ladder and it only brings me to depression. It only brings me to emptiness. It's never rewarding and fulfilling. I've worked my fingers to the bones and now I realize I still feel empty. I've come to not. I have to go to counselors for this and for that and for all the, this stuff. 
Because my mind's not sober. It's not solid. I'm on shifting sand. It didn't give me the exercise. You know, you see so many people that do these exercises and they work and they get Mr. Olympia and then you see them later and they're like paraplegics as their body's been broken down from all this stress they put on it because they became obsessed with the external and were forgetting the internal. Verse 2 says, For now, for I know the forwardness of your mind, for which I boast on you to them in Macedonia and Achaia, I was ready a year ago, and your zeal hath provoked many, very many. I love this because what he's saying is he says, I've seen your works, and your works have bore fruit. It's not you boasting on yourself, but your word of what you've done has gone out because others are boasting on you. And not only are they boasting on you, you've stirred them up to jealousy that now they're doing it. Isn't that really what we're all about here? Isn't it really to see Jesus Christ, see he's right, follow him, and as we follow him, others see that he's right and follow as well? They see the blessings and they enter into it. They release from the bondages of this world and they walk in freedom, preaching the gospel. You're eager to give to the church for the needs of the ministry, both physically and spiritually, he's saying to them. And this giving heart is stirring up others to give as well. It's something inside that can't be explained. They're just letting go. Letting go. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12 says, Let go, or let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example to believers in word and in conversation, in love and in spirit, in faith and in purity. As we continue on in verse 3, it says, Yet have I sent the brethren, lest our boasting of you should be in vain in this behalf that I said ye may be ready. He's saying, even though I have no need to teach you these things, I have no need to come and check up, I'm coming anyways to make sure that everything that's been said of you is not as shameful as they find you not ready. How many of us think, I already know this, I already got it, I, already got it. I don't need to hear those stuff again. We need to be renewed in our mind. Second Timothy chapter Chapter uh, 2, verse 15 says, Study to show yourself a proof watchman that need not be as ashamed, a worker that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Constantly our minds are overwhelmed with this world and we forget. Don't we? This is sometimes, you know, as we're getting ready to come into memorials the other week. Why do we have memorials? To remind us the things that have happened. Why do we have a community? To remind us of what Jesus Christ has done. We constantly need reminders. Our, our, our mind is so overwhelmed, we forget. We forget, and, and then we need to come back and get back into the Word and go, oh, yeah, Why, what is my motivation? Why am I doing what I'm doing? Not for men pleasing, not for external outside people to see, but for God Almighty to be pleased. For God to see, because He's my strength. Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says, And be not conformed to the world, but be you transformed through the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable in the perfect will of God. We have to constantly check our deeds and make sure this is God's will. Not my will. Even in our giving. Amen? It's got to be even in our giving. And everything we do, do as unto the Lord. To bring glory to God. Which Josiah taught this morning. Remember and don't forget. Second, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10 says, For the love of money is the root of evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. I ran after this, and all it's brought me is emptiness. All I really want is the love of my family. All I really want is to be one and accepted of God. All I really want that really matters, God gives. Money can't buy. Amen? Money can't buy. Be ready is the second part. He says, be ready there. That's why I'm setting them so that you'll be ready. I want you not to be found naked and ashamed. Put your pants on. Jesus is coming. Get ready. Cook a meal. Make sure the house is cleaned up. This past week I had someone come into the house and I wanted to make sure everything was right. I, I pulled out all the weeds in the front. I put up new flowers. I put down uh, mulch. I bought a new pot. I'm doing things I would never do. I vacuumed. I cleaned and swept the, the floor. Every time the dogs came in from the grass, I picked up the grass one by one. I was getting ready. 
like being prepared. I wanted it to be a blessing. Amen? I even bought flowers so they would look pretty at the table. So many things we do to get ready for people to see us. But are we getting ready for God? The second reason is to get ready. First reason, why do we want to be ready? Because we just talked about it, the mall incident. There's a devil out there, there's a spiritual battle going on around us, and he's looking to destroy you. He's always going to attack you. You know, most of the times when I fall as a Christian, I bet you guys can probably attest to this, it's not when things are going perfect and everything's good and he comes in subtly and I'm like, I got that, boom. It's when he storms you, when you don't expect it. It's the ambush. You're sitting here and you're, you're in men's group. Next thing you know, one of the men wants to wrestle. Turns into WWE. You're like, uh, what do I do with this thing? <laughs> How do I handle this? You're ambushed, right? You don't realize what's going on here. That's when the heart really comes to the surface, isn't it? That's when the truth of who you are comes out. It's when you're startled. How do you perform when you're not thinking so much and it's just natural? 1 Peter 5, verse 8 says, Be sober and vigilant, because your adversary the devil like, is as a roaring lion walketh, seeking whom he may devour. He's out there always looking to ambush you. He's not going to stop. He may, he may separate from him for a season, but he's coming back. What are you clinging to? Are you ready? Are we trained up? Are we encouraging one another? Do we have checks and balances in place? Are we humbling ourselves accountable like the guys in the... In the, in the um, the idolatry group that's meeting nightly, weekends. Are we constantly checking? Or we think we got it? You think you stand? Careful. Careful. Satan's a much better chess player than you are. And he's much more strong physically. That's not going to help you in the battle against him. Here's the second reason, and what is the truth of the matter, is Jesus is coming. That's a fact. Jesus is coming. We're looking at the perilous times all around us, and we're still hardening our hearts, saying, no, nah, we got plenty of time. We're going to get married. I got my plans. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. The Lord says, don't think you have that time. Don't go and plan out all this stuff, but say, if it's the Lord's will, I shall do this. Because I want to be found ready. Ready. Matthew chapter 4, verse 44, and there's many scripture verses we could go through, but it says, for this reason... You must be ready as well, for the Son of Man cometh in an hour when you think not, he will come. When you're not ready, that's when he's going to come, when you least expect it. Some think it's the midnight hour. I always say, I had this, this theory, nothing good happens after 10. <laughs> get back in bed, get in your prayer life, get in bed. We're children of the light. Amen? Careful. Careful. Matthew chapter 25, verse 13 says, Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherewithin the Son of Man will come. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 says, But sanctify the Lord thy God in thy hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh for the reason of the hope that's within you, with meekness and fear. Be witnesses, right? Be lights. Be busy about his business. That's how you're found ready. When he comes back, I want to be found busy about his business. Not clinging to the affairs of this world. Not solving the problems of, of all of Crimea and, you know, and Russia and all the governments. That's not my job. And nowhere could I even come close to doing that. It's not who I am. It's not the bubble God's given me. The ministry's right before you. The ministry's right next to you. You don't have to go to Facebook and go all around the world to figure out the problems that God has put before you to glorify Him. He puts them in front of you every day when you go to the grocery store and everywhere else. When you come to this church, he's put people before you to minister to. Always, always we're to be witnesses in whatever we say we do. Verse 5 goes on and says, Therefore I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren that they may that they would go before you and make, uh, make up beforehand your bounty, wherefore ye had noticed before that the same might be ready as a matter of bounty and not, not of covetousness. There's a, there's a word there that, that's being pulled out. You've heard it multiple times. You may hear it again a couple times before we're done with this chapter. It's bounty. Bounty. Some say, okay, that's your tithe or whatever. But no, really what bounty means is what's gone before you is your praise. 
People have been talking good about you. The Bible says it's, to, it's it better as a good name to have a good reputation. Don't ruin your good reputation. He said, I'm sending people to make sure you keep going. Keep doing what you're doing. You're doing great. Don't stop. He says, you've got a great testimony. It's also the word we use when we go to memorial services or funeral services. I don't like to call them funeral. Memorial, especially for Christians. It's a memorial. It's a lifting up. We speak good things. It's called a eulogy. That's, what the, that's the Greek word that's being used there is eulogy. It's eulogy. It's giving a great testimony or praise or fine speech about somebody. These people had a great speech about them, great reputation because of who they were. They had a great testimony. And I like how that ends. It said, instead, what's the contrary? What's the contrary of a good testimony? Covetousness. Covetousness. Wanting that which God has not given you. Going after those things that are not yours. I need a better Corvette. I need a better truck. I need a better house. <clears throat> I need better, 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 more, 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 more. Did you see the Jones? They just did something real special with the front of their house. Maybe I need to get some bushes. Those flowers aren't enough. That mulch is not. Yeah, I gotta do more. The next thing you know, it's like one of those video games you're playing. I hate those games. I'm like, you're constantly building the neighborhood. The Sims, they're Sims. You're building a giant city. And I'm like, I can't even build my own house. And I'm trying to buy with minimal money some flower pot to put in front of a virtual house. To outdo the Joneses, who when they let you zoom over and see someone else's city, and you're like, whoa, I don't have one of those. Let's buy that. Are you serious? Delete, 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 delete. Don't covet. Don't covet what others have. Don't try to buy up this world. This isn't our world. You're not taking it with you when you leave. We're going through my dad's place. He's got 70 something years, I won't say. Of stuff he's accrued. I helped him a couple days already. I'm pretty sore. Of course, this is when my brother tried to attack me. When I'm weak, I'm sore. And I've been carrying a lot of boxes and stuff. And if that's when he wrestled me. That's when he wants to arm wrestle me. I'm like, dude, that'll work. And I didn't tell him. Now you know. The real reason. But but yesterday I'm down in my dad's basement. And we're like, oh, let's take it. Um, Steve and I are down there trying to take stuff out of his basement. And we look, and we see all the rat poop and spiders. My dad's like, go open that door. I walk through some spider webs. And I'm not talking about a web that gets in your eye or in your hair. And you're like, ah! No, I'm talking about the dark alley to a door. And I shine the light, which I should have. And I start walking, and I'm wrapped in from head to toe spider webs. I'm like, ah! Backed up, manly Gary. And I shine it up. Give me a broom. And I clear it all out, turn it up, and laugh. But, but what, what happened was we started having to carry big boxes. There were 30 or something close to that boxes filled with books. Books with rotten bottoms. Oh. Yeah, yeah, a lot of work. Constantly tired, trying to do, trying to do all these things, and, and, and it's not, it's not the physical part, it was the spiritual part to bless him. It was just, you just see all this stuff that he's accrued over the years, and now he's buying these giant trucks trailer-sized bins to throw everything away, to throw it all away. Isn't that what we do? Now, that being said, if you guys have anything of value, save it for our sale in August with the flood. We're going to be giving a sale to the community, try to bless the community. So save it up. We can empty it there. But good stuff. Not boxes full of books with rotten bottoms and, and rat food and spider webs. <laughs> throw that away. Throw that away. We can't take it with us. Amen? To continue on in verse 6 of 2 Corinthians chapter 9, it says, But this I say, he which sow, soweth sparingly shall reap sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. There's that word again, bountifully, or with joy, or with a good testimony. <clears throat> Tithing in the Old Testament, as we think about it, was to give a tenth of what you had. It says actually in Leviticus chapter 27, verse 30, a tithe of everything from the land, whether grain or soil or fruit or trees, they all belong to the Lord. It is holy unto the Lord. It's set apart for the Lord. This was the law. The law was to give back. We're going through the first fruits of God and him wanting the first fruits, your firstborn, your first animal, everything like that. On Thursday, we just did a great uh, Bible study on that. Go back and watch it. And why these things were set aside for God. What this was for. This tithe was for the ministry. 
This tithe was to continue those temporary sacrifices that were going on in the temple, for the workers of the temple, for everything that was going on. This was money set apart to minister to the people, or to intercede for the people and the needs of the people. Now, in the New Testament, there's no amount that's given to us. I know some people will say, well, that was a tenth then, it's not now. And I know other people say, no, now it's everything. <laughs> but the Lord is saying, what do you give hilariously? What do you give in response to what I've done for you? And isn't that a personal choice? Isn't that a personal thing that you have to come to God with? You have to come to God and say, what would you have me to give, Lord? What is your will? What do I have need of? What does the church have need of? What have you put around me that has needs? We have to think of others, right? We have to first think of God and then give to him first. But we should always still be given our first fruits, our very best. Not our leftovers, not our scraps, but the very best. The gifts are supposed to be a reminder to us that everything belongs to God. It's not just a portion, but the whole world. He's redeemed it all. It's all his anyways. We're just giving back out of gratitude. You know, you know, we talk about sowing sparingly, and I think I told some of you guys I had this dead spot next to my patio that I'm trying to grow grass. Well, the birds all came and ate all my grass. So I put some hay in front of that, and then I said, all right, try eating all this, and I doused it with seed. Guess what? Grass is growing. <laughs> they got fat and happy and left, and now I got grass growing. But sometimes we sow sparingly, it may die, right? Keep going. Some of us are witnessing the people, and we quit on them. It may not be the first seed. Maybe you need to keep walking more as an example. They're trying you. They're testing you. They're watching you. We quit too soon doing what's right because why? Because we're doing it for them rather than who has already called us to do it and who we should be trying to please. Amen? We do what we do to please God, not people around us. We're doing what we're witnessing to people and sowing seed because God commands us to do it. Not because they'll receive it or they won't receive it. That's a lighter yoke, isn't it? No, I'm not. Shifting sand. Standing on the rock. Whether you receive it or don't, I'm still going to do what's right. I'm still going to give what God's given me to give to you. I'm going to sow, and I'm not going to just sow here. I'm going to sow there. I'm going to sow everywhere. Sparingly. I mean, not sparingly. And abundantly. Verse 7 goes on and says, Every man according to his purpose in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly, out of necessity, for the love of God, uh, for God loveth a cheerful giver, as we already said earlier. We're, su we're supposed to be doing this always out of, out of a good, pure heart. Jeremiah, verse 17, verse 10 says, I Lord, search the heart, try the reins, even give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. <clears throat> He's more concerned with the attitude of adoration than he is about the amount of your giving and the adoration or love of God than he is about the amount you're giving. Remember that. He's looking on the heart, not the intellect. What will men say if I did this? How will other people look if I give this? And, you know, we think about Jesus giving the example, and we're not going to go into it, but if you go to Mark chapter 12, verse 38 to 44, it talks about the woman who gives two mites. Who's a poor woman who gave, thinking nobody saw. She wasn't doing it to be seen. Matter of fact, she might have even been ashamed of what she was giving. Because that's all she had to give. She gave all she had. Jesus said. But he was watching. And he told the disciples, right before they said, You see these Pharisees that are puffing themselves up, seating, sitting in the best seats of the house, walking and giving, look at me, look at me, look at me. This woman's greater right here who has nothing. And just gave everything she had. He's watching. Please God. Don't please men. Give to please God. Matthew chapter 6 verse 3 says, But when thou doest thou alms, let, them, let not the left hand know what the right hand doeth. Keep it in secret between you and God. Amen? Verse 8 continues on and says, and God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you always have all sufficiency in things you may abound in every good work. I like this. Don't lose this scripture verse. Write it down. What is he saying here? This is helping me right now. Sometimes, when we're in situations where life is difficult, we think we need to back away from God. 
We think I need to get stuff in order, then I'll come back to God. I'm going to tie once I get my life all organized. I'm going to get back to God once, I, once everything's back proper. I'll start teaching once I get better. You know, once I clean up my life. That's ridiculous. God is the giver of every good and perfect gift, and he gives graciously. What does gracious mean? What does grace mean? You don't deserve it. You don't earn it. You can't. It's a gift. It's unmerited favor. God looks at you and says, I'm giving you what you don't deserve. I'm giving you what you don't deserve. You should give to those who don't deserve. The Lord says that's where true treasure is stored up. Those who can't give back. Those who've done wrong to you. That's real reward. That's God kingdom. That's you. You didn't deserve it. But God gave it to you, didn't he? That's awesome giving. It's when your foundation's shaken the most when we want to pull back is when we should be pouring out all the more by faith. It's when you think you're at your wit's end that you should pour out all your ends to God. Ah, I lost my job. I lost this. I lost that. <laughs> Charge forward even more. Even more I'm going to dump in. Isn't that what causes Satan to run away? He throws at you his very best. You stand firmer all the more in God. I'm going to trust God all the more in this victory. Oh, you want to bring it? I'm going to bring it. I'm going to bring him. I'm going to bring him light to this matter. My God. God will provide for all our needs. We should not hold back service because we're concerned about our future. Instead, we should give service because we're concerned about our future. Amen? <laughs> God is faithful. We need to walk by faith in him and give him our first fruits, just as we learned about on Thursday. Go watch that, please. Verse 9 says, As it is written, He hath dispersed abroad and hath given to the poor. His righteousness remaineth forever. Matthew chapter 6, verse 26 goes on and says, Behold, the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather in barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than the birds of the air, the fowls? No, no offense to my little, my little beautiful Cassie, who's finally healthy and in church and running around, and I love it. She's not. I'm distracted, so let her run up here, bring keys. I was hoping she would join in the worship, shaking those keys. But she, they have a picture on social media. I'm not out there, but I live vicariously through others. And I heard she was, has a picture of her with a chicken, kissing a chicken, running and chasing down chickens. I think chickens are repulsive. I think they're one of them. They're the cutest little things when they're babies, but when they get older, they're the ugliest looking animal I've ever seen. I hate them. They're hideous. And yet, God cares for them. How much more are you? Why are you worried about tomorrow? Why are you not giving up your time and your energy and your, and your, and your resources and the things that you have to the ministry that's eternal? Why are you concerned about chicken faces? I mean, seriously, guys. Amen? Give. God's got that now. He's got you. He loved you so much, he sent his son to come and die for you, to redeem you forever. Forever. Verse 10 says, Now he that ministereth seed, seed to the sower, both minister bread for our food, and multiply your seed so, and increases the fruits of, of your righteousness. He who gives isn't just giving you everything you need for the physical body. But he's imputed unto you everything you need for eternal heaven, which is righteousness, pureness, holiness. That's our ministry here, guys. We're ministering to the whole of people. When they come, they're getting ministered to their souls. That's what you're giving to. Not just here, but everywhere that's been made abroad as the boasting of our church. We're a tiny church and we've reached around the entire world and are continuing to reach around the entire world. We give thousands to ministries around the whole world. Do you understand that? Do you understand the reputation of our church? Look around you. I said thousands. Pretty awesome, huh? God's pretty awesome. We cannot outgive God. It's, you know, we think about a ciphering effect. For those of you that steal gas from other people, especially now that the prices are so high, stick the tube in someone else's car, suck it, let it go. What happens? The cipher keeps it going, but then run quickly. Always have a watch out. Joking. 
Of course, I'm not stealing gas. I was at the gas station yesterday, and I'm filling up, and for some reason, the little door underneath was open. And I'm like, hmm, what's that? I was tempted to push some buttons and say, can you give me free gas? I didn't. But it said, it said like, test and this and that. I guess it's someone who works there that somehow left the door open. I don't know what it was for. But I didn't push the buttons. But then I said, oh, free gas. And then three people go, free gas! And then I came running over. What's going on? What's going on? Oh, nothing. Free gas, gas has become that way, right? Ciphering, you usually get the equal amount of pressure. I'm not going to get into the science. We'll have people like Trevor do a lot smarter explain that to you guys if you need it. But, but ciphering, usually the same amount that comes out is going to be the same flow. With God, you start by starting, by opening your heart, and then he pours in more than you pull out. He multiplies it. Malachi chapter 3 verse 10 says, Bring all your tithes to the storehouse that I may meet, uh, that there may be meat in my house, and prove me now. Test me, he says there within, if I will not open to you windows from heaven and pour you out blessings, and there shall not be enough room for you to receive it. You can't outgive me. You cannot outgive me. Luke chapter 6 verse 38 says, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken. Together, running it over, shall men give unto you to your bosom. If you give, they'll give back to you. You can't outgive. It keeps coming. For with the same measure that you shall with all, shall, uh, with all it shall be measured again unto you. So as you give, it's just going to keep coming like that cipher. Like you give it away, now more comes. You give it away, now more comes. It's, it's amazing. God multiplies what we give. Jesus talking about this to the disciples. As he's preaching to everybody, and we think, well, God only talks concerned about the spiritual needs. I, I, I always say this when you're tithing. There are tangible needs that this body has. We have things we buy. We're doing a youth tournament this, this Friday to reach out to the community. We had to buy a ticket for our um, cars and have the logo on there because everyone asked for that. We had to do a lot. We're going to buy pizza. We're going to buy things. We have a meetup group that we send out the invitations out. We pay for all these things behind the scenes. There's a lot that goes on with this church. So there's physical needs, and as Jesus is preaching all day long, he sees the people that are hungry. The disciples says, go home and get some food. And Jesus says, wait a minute. You already have all you need. Bring it to me, and let me multiply it. He says, what Jesus said unto them, they, shall, they need not depart, give you them to eat. And they say unto him, we, we have here but five loaves and two fishes. And he said, bring them hither to me. And he commanded the multitudes to sit down on the grass. And he took the five loaves and the two fishes. And looking up to heaven, he blessed the break that gave the loaves to his disciples and the disciples to, multiple, to the multitude. And they did all eat and were filled. And they took up the fragments that remained in twelve baskets full. And they that had eaten were about five thousand men besides the women and the children. So he takes the seven fishes, loaves, and, and five fishes, and he multiplies to the point where they pick up 12 basketball after. That's the leftovers. Now that's a multiplying. <laughs> I want that in my fridge. It says, open up the fridge, eat something, and we back. It's not only back, but it's filled more. That's how God does. Why do we give? Why do we give? He says here in this scripture verse, it's for thanksgiving. It's to glorify God, and it's to spread the gospel. It's for thanksgiving, it's to glorify God, and it's to spread the gospel. God changes hearts. You know, we want to make sure that we're giving because it's the heart that changes. It's the attitude that we talk about. And if, if you go on in verse 11, it says, <clears throat> Being enriched in everything to bountifulness, there it is again, good testimony to, to giving, which causes through us thanksgiving of God for the, administ for the administration of this service, not only supply the want of the saints, but is abundant also by many thanksgiving unto God. So it's the at our attitude should always be that of thanksgiving. The Lord said be thankful in all things. We should be thankful that we have that to give to the administration of the church or to the needs of the body. You know, it, it's, it's one of those things where we say... Glorify God in all we do, and also for the gospel's sake, liberating that nothing will be held back. Give free, giving the gifts of God. Um, Acts chapter 20, verse 35 says, I have showed you all things 
how that so laboring you ought to support the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, how he said it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. We have so we can give. And isn't it a blessing? I heard someone say the other day to me, you know, there's nothing more rewarding than helping someone who's in need. It's like when you see that, and you'll start to see rich people even do this. They start to make up their bad deeds, everything they did to get to the position that they were in, by doing good deeds. This is a Catholic kind of thing, right? If I beat myself, then I've overcome my sin. No, Christ was beaten for your sins. You're giving not to try to repay the damage you've done, although you should repay the damage you've done. But that's not why you're doing it. You're doing it because of God's giving to you out of gratitude. And you want them to have what God's given to you. Now you understand. It's not to outdo your bad deeds. It's blessed to give. Yeah, God's given to me and I want to bless others. And that's, that's the joy of it. Verse 14, it continues on. I'm sorry, verse 13, it says, While by the experiment of the ministry... Oh, he did that, sorry. Verse 14, it says, And by the new prayer for you, which long after... You are ex exceedingly grace of God. Did you, you ever read a book? I'm going to stop here. I want, to, I want you guys to understand why I'm fumbling right now. Because did you ever watch a movie and you want to tell somebody the end? And you're like trying to get through it really quick so you can get to the end so you can, so you can tell them that you're so excited? Some of you don't know, but I told you on the notice that I had some good news to tell you. So I'm, I'm struggling here because it keeps coming to my mind, the good news. This is the hilariously that God's talking about when he says give, hilariously. I can't contain it. I'm sitting here like, I got to read the scripture for a really quick. I got all these really cool things I want to tell you guys, but I got to get to the testimony. I want to get to the testimony. So forgive me. <laughs> forgive me for stumbling on these last few scripture verses. And by the prayer for you, which long after you, for the exceeding grace of God is in you, thanks be unto God for this unspeakable gift. God gives grace. We already talked about that. That's unmerited favor. He gives unto us what we don't deserve always. It doesn't stop. Remember Paul and the thorn in the side, the messenger of Satan buffeting him? What did God say to him? What? My grace is sufficient. What? My grace is sufficient. Wow, you guys got fired for one, two, three. My grace is sufficient. It's all we need. You don't need all that money. You don't need all that time spending and all these other things. You don't need all these extra superfluous. Things. Amen? You need God's grace. You need God's grace, and you got it. That's what you need. You need God's grace. God's gift goes beyond comprehension. We can't even... It would almost be sin to try to describe the graces of God. Because it goes so beyond our comprehension. And we would have to diminish it. The gifts of God Almighty. We'd have to shrink it to our English language or whatever language you speak, which is not sufficient. His gift is unending, abounds like a spring of blessings. Where there is no end to it. It just keeps coming again and again and again in this life. It's eternal goodness. There's no time frame. It goes on forever. I don't even understand forever, but that's how long it goes on. It doesn't stop. Do you got that? That's why we give our tiny little temporal gift to give thanks for the eternal abundant gift that he's already given us. I can say it now. Yeah. <laughs> so, hey, don't play. <laughs> I know, I know. I know. Um, guys, I told you guys a few weeks ago I had some good news potentially to tell you. And the reason why I said I had some good news potentially to tell you, because I've run into so many people that have good intentions, but don't follow through. There's a man that I know, that I've known for many years, and he's a young man in his 20s, and we would talk at lunch, and, and we would just talk about God. He's been jaded by church. He's been hurt by this televangelists and people seeking money all the time and doing their things. But he was very frivolous. He says, I want to retire by the time I'm 30. I'm going to save every money. So he wouldn't even buy his lunch. So I go out. Sometimes I buy his lunch for him. I'm like, come on out. I just want to talk to you about the Lord. So let's buy pizza or whatever. Well, this time he invited me out. He says, I want to pay for your lunch. I said, okay. So I, I went out. I told him about my circumstances in life and the struggles I had. And I did what I always do. I boasted on our church. 
I boasted on the incredible church that we have, the hospital that we have, the ministries that we have. And I've done this all along. And he asked me, he said, how do you guys do tithes? I said, well, we have tithely. And we have, um, we have, you can write a check or you can come to church because, by the way, the greatest present you can give is your presence. Be here. That's the best thing. And I go, we have a box in the back. We don't push you to give. We hope they'll give, hilariously, out of the abundance of what the Lord is doing in their hearts. She said, okay. Then he invited me to lunch a couple weeks later. He says, I don't want you to change your ideas about who I am or how you treat me or anything else. But he goes, I want to tie it to your church. I said, okay. And he told me I'm out. And I was like, okay. I said, you know, that's, that's pretty cool. But I thought, what an encouragement of God. But like Missouri, show me, show me the money. <laughs> right? And I prayed for him. Well, he shows up to my house. Well, first he called and said, can I come over? I said, sure. So he shows up to my house this past week. And he puts... $10,000 on the table and says, this is for your church. And I went, you're a 20 year old, you're 20 and you're faithful, tears. You're doing what God wants, you've given out of abundance. And he said, and I said, are you sure? He said, I've never been more sure of anything. Your church is doing what God wants. You're doing, you're doing the truth, and I've been to many, and I've seen others, and you're doing it. I want to I give my tithes to you. God showed me this. I said, thank you. Thank you. That's why we give. This is the testimony. This is why we're teaching this this Sunday, and God already knew it, because Josiah is teaching it in the back of basics. It's the Holy Spirit, guys. It's God providing for the needs of this church. In your needs, wherever you're at in this life. Amen? Why are you holding back? Doesn't it make you want to run forward? He's got you. You can't outgive him. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, I thank you for your faithfulness. Father, there is no one who sticks closer than you. You are an always, ever-present help in time of need. Father, Search our hearts. Try our thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in us, Lord, and lead us into the ways of everlasting. Help us to let go of the monies and the things of this world that have become our idols. And, Lord, replace them with you. We want your very best, Lord, your grace. You are all-sufficient. Help us to see that. Open the eyes of the blind. Help us to be busy about your business so that when you come back, we have much fruit to give to you, Lord God. Because you are worthy. You are worthy of all our praise, of all our thanksgiving. Help us, Father, to let go of those things that are hindering us, those things that are quenching the spirit, those things that are kinking the hose of your blessings. Let us let go, no matter what it is or who it is. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.